Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So I haven't made one of these solved or unsolved cases videos in quite some time and I know a lot of people like to watch them. I know I like to watch these kind of videos and I really love to research them and make them. So I figured it was about time I sit down and film one. So in today's case, I'm covering the tragic absolutely heartbreaking murder and torture of five-year-old Nathan O'Brien and his grandparents Elvin and Kathy Lickness. So quick warning, all of the cases I cover are very heartbreaking and tragic, but like I said, this one not only involves murder, but it involves torture um, and of course involves a child. So if you really do not want to hear about that, then click out of this video. Nathan O'Brien was born September 21st in 2008 to his loving parents, Rod and Jennifer O'Brien. He had blonde hair, he was this beautiful little boy, and his parents absolutely adored him. He loved superheroes. He actually dressed up as a superhero for his fifth birthday. He was the type of child who would go up to any little kid on the playground and ask them if they wanted to play with him. Didn't matter what they looked like or how old they were. He was just super, super friendly. He also had two brothers. He had one older and one younger. He was apparently best friends with his older brother. They got along amazing. Apparently they barely ever fought. They were always just playing together and getting along and he really looked up to his older brother. And then of course he had his baby brother who his family still often shows the baby photos of Nathan and tells the baby all about him and how much he loved him. And then of course he was very close with his parents as well. Nathan's father Rod actually said how he and Nathan would have little late night chats before bed at night. And one of the nights Nathan actually asked his father what heaven was like. And of course Rod thought, well that's you know a strange question for a five year old to ask. Um, but he said it was wonderful and you can fly around like a superhero as much as you'd like and spend all the time in the world with your loved ones. And to that, Nathan actually said that he can't wait to welcome him into heaven. That Nathan can't wait to welcome his father into heaven. And of course, Rod thought, okay, like, it's kind of strange. And, and he actually thought that maybe Nathan mixed it up and he meant that his dad would welcome him into heaven. But it was just one of those things where kids talk and you don't really think anything of it. But when I read that now, knowing how everything turned out, it just gives me goosebumps. So as for Nathan's grandparents, Elvin and Kathy, they were apparently amazing people. Total hands-on grandparents would do anything for their families. They always wanted to be involved. Um, and have sleepovers with their grandchildren and whatever Rod and Jennifer needed, they were always there for them and they also just seemed like really genuine people. So on the weekend of June 27th to the 29th, Kathy and Elvin Lickness were actually having an estate sale, basically just clearing things out, getting things organized because they had actually recently bought a house in Edmonton. So Jennifer and Rod brought over their three boys and kind of helped them out and spent the day with them, just having some quality family time really. So on the 29th when the sale was over, Nathan had actually really wanted to stay over with his grandparents and have a sleepover, something that he often wanted to do. He was very close with his grandparents and everything was okay. That was totally fine. Jennifer, Nathan's mom, was actually planning on staying over as well with the other two boys, but for some reason decided against it. She just decided to go home, take her other two sons with her, but Nathan really wanted to stay and have a sleepover with his grandparents. So that was okay with Jennifer. She hugged her parents and she hugged Nathan and kissed him goodbye. And that would be the last time she ever saw her son or her parents again. So the next day on June 30th at around 10 in the morning, Jennifer returned to the house to pick up Nathan from his sleepover with his grandparents. But when she arrived, she knew that something was very off and very strange because the front door was already wide open. But she would have never guessed the horrifically disturbing scene that she would be walking into that day. There was 
blood everywhere. There was blood all over the floor. There was blood all over the walls, including bloody handprints. Obviously, she was in shock. She was in hysterics. She was absolutely shaking. And to add to all this, her parents and her son were nowhere to be seen. So, of course, she called the police in absolute hysterics, as anyone would be if you walk into that kind of scene. And the police were actually worried that there would be somebody still in the house. So they instructed her to get into her car, lock the door and wait there for them and they would be there as soon as possible. When police got to the scene, they knew that whatever had happened in that house was very, very violent due to the amount of blood in the house and that whatever had happened to whoever blood that belonged to, they needed medical attention immediately. Another thing that I read that was absolutely heartbreaking is that there was actually a child size handprint on the wall as if the child had been dragged out and they were bracing themselves. So right away the police had hoped that since there were no bodies, maybe they had been kidnapped or were being held somewhere. They didn't want to assume the worst right away. And on top of all this, they couldn't find any trace of DNA or uh, even a fingerprint of a potential suspect of someone that could have done this. So using absolutely any resources they could, the police issued an Amber Alert for Nathan, Kathy, and Elvin. On July 2nd, Jennifer and Rod make a very, very emotional plea for the safe return of their parents and their son. Jennifer actually said that she knew that her mother was holding her baby boy very, very tight and that for him to remember that he's a superhero and to be strong and that they will find him and be with him very, very soon. On July 4th, only a couple days later, the police actually asked for the public's assistance in identifying a green Ford truck that was seen nearby the day Nathan and his grandparents went missing. Not long after releasing this picture of the green Ford truck, they actually got a call from a woman who claimed that she believed to know who the truck belonged to, and she believed that person was her brother, 57-year-old Doug Garland. Of course, this is a lead that the police were waiting for, so they went on the search for Doug Garland and actually found him at a traffic stop where they were able to hold him in jail because of a previous false identity charge. Meanwhile, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police searched all over the 40-acre farm where Doug Garland lived with his parents. And when the police got there, they couldn't find anyone dead or alive. But what they did notice was a burn barrel still smoldering with smoke near the greenhouses on the property. But they couldn't find any blood or evidence at all in the barrel. So back at the jail, Doug was released on bond. But he was given strict instructions by the police not to go back to the farm. They still felt that it was totally worth searching every inch of the 40 acre farm. And of course, they just didn't want Doug going back there at all to tamper with anything. And what they would later find under the basement rafters was absolutely disturbing. They found a computer hard drive, and when they looked further into what was on it, they found searches he had made on things like um, most painful ways to torture. Um, he searched up things like the best time to make an attack, and it would say, oh, at three in the morning, to get that element of surprise. The hard drive was also filled with images of his sexual fantasy fetishes, and one of those fetishes included men and women in adult diapers. There were images of men and women being strained and tortured while wearing adult diapers. They found books on how to poison people. They found a book titled The Joy of Killing. They found blonde wigs on mannequins, 89 pairs of shoes, as well as women's clothing in Doug's size. Investigators also found an empty shoebox in the closet that would have been a pair of size 13 Dr. Scholl's tennis shoes, and I want you to remember that detail because I will bring it up later on. Some more pieces of absolutely disturbing evidence that the police found were boxes of countless weapons, including handcuffs. One was actually in child size, hacksaw blades, bone saws, leather straps, guns, knives, and even a straight jacket. But even though there was this, you know, overwhelming amount of evidence, they still had 
no bodies. They still couldn't find Nathan and Elvin and Kathy. I do have to say after researching this case, the police did an absolutely amazing job with investigating thoroughly in, on this case, searching everywhere for what they needed. And sometimes you don't see that and police work is just poor. And that is not the case with this one. They tried so hard and did amazing work. They decided to go back to the burn barrel that I mentioned earlier on that still was smoldering by the greenhouses because they felt it was worth taking another look. And this time they did actually end up finding a baby tooth along with human flesh and bone fragments. And that pretty much shattered the hope that they would ever find Nathan and his grandparents alive. But the question was why? Why would Doug Garland want to kill an innocent five-year-old boy and his loving grandparents? And with a little investigating, they actually figured out that Doug Garland had some history with Elvin and Kathy Lickness. Doug had actually known Kathy and Elvin Lickness for years and had a fairly layered, complicated relationship with them. So just try and stay with me here while I kind of explain how they got acquainted. So Doug's sister's name is Patty and Patty was the woman who actually called the police identifying the truck saying she knew the man who it belonged to. And Patty is actually married to Kathy and Elvin's son, okay? But the main detail that really sparked the police's interest in the whole relationship is that Elvin was actually a pretty successful entrepreneur and he actually hired Doug by the suggestion of Elvin's son to work on this new project he had going on seeing as Doug was unemployed and didn't have much going on in his life. Elvin thought, hey, why don't you come help me out with this project? They were actually working on a pump invention that never really got anywhere, never really got off the ground, so therefore Elvin didn't make a penny from it. So seeing it was seeing as how it wasn't financially successful, he decided to fire Doug because it wasn't wasn't going well. The project wasn't going well. And even though Elvin was the brains behind the invention of the pump and never made a penny off of it, Doug still felt very cheated and screwed over by Elvin because he fired him and he felt like his chance of riches and making money off of this project had been ruined and apparently he was really really bitter towards Elvin for years after that. So with the evidence piling up against Doug and the police discovering a potential motive for the murder, the police kept a very very close eye on Doug. And to add to the evidence, the police actually found a surveillance video of Doug buying saw blades and even more importantly, he was wearing the exact same Dr. Scholl's tennis shoes that were missing from the box that they found at the farm. Remember I told you to remember that? So they thought that there was pretty strong evidence as well. And the exact same style of Dr. Scholl's tennis shoes matched a bloody shoe print that was found in the home where Nathan and his grandparents were attacked. So even though no bodies were found, the police had discovered 1,400 pieces of evidence against Doug Garland, so therefore they had enough to finally make their arrest. But Doug Garland also wanted to make a move because two weeks after Nathan and his grandparents went missing, he was spotted sneaking back onto the farm where he was told not to go to, and the police believed he went there to tamper with evidence and hide some more things that he did not want the police to find. But Doug didn't get far because the police actually cornered him, Doug surrendered, and that is when the police made their arrest. So even though there was an overwhelming amount of evidence against Doug Garland, he still pled not guilty to three counts of first degree murder. The trial went on for about five weeks and absolutely gripped the surrounding communities. Everyone was so heartbroken by the tragedy of the lives lost by these three innocent people and they wanted justice. The prosecutors explained that Doug felt so much anger and bitterness towards Elvin that he was willing to commit murder and he knew that they were moving so he decided that if, he's, if he was going to commit the murder that he'd have to do it soon. The prosecutors explained that Doug broke into the home at 3 in the morning, which is what the internet said online to do to have that element of surprise during the attack. The prosecutors also explained that Doug broke into the home by drilling a hole into one of the locks. First he went into Elvin's room and bludgeoned him while he was sleeping. He then proceeded to go into the room where Kathy and Nathan were sleeping. And 
Investigators believed that five-year-old Nathan wasn't originally a target, but he was there and Doug didn't want any witnesses to the crime. Forensic experts believe that the family was still alive when Doug dragged them out of their house in the middle of the night and shoved them into his truck. And that's when Doug drove the 20 miles to the rural farm where him and his parents lived. Tragically, that's where even more horror awaited them. And another warning, this is where I talk about the torture. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the details just because it's just really upsetting. If you wanna know more about it, more details, look it up online, but I will just get into a little bit of the details, but another warning. It's really, really, really disturbing and upsetting. So Kathy's DNA was found on meat hooks. Elvin and Nathan's DNA was found on bone saws, and all three of their DNA was found on rubber boots, on the outside of the rubber boots. To add to the absolutely horrific evidence that was shown at trial, they also showed an image that was actually captured by a mapping plane that was flying over the farm at the time that the crime was being committed. And this image showed three headless torsos, two of them being adult sized, one looking like a child size. The three bodies were right by the burn barrels. So that was also shown as evidence at the trial. Again, no bodies were ever found. All that was found was um, bone fragments and human flesh and the embers of the burn barrel. So basically, Doug Garland cut them up and cremated them. The whole time that this evidence was shown at trial, Doug Garland had absolutely no emotion, looked like he had absolutely no remorse at all completely stone cold. The victim's families chose not to take a stand at court. However, Nathan's father, Rod, actually read a victim's impact statement. And it was so raw and so powerful and so heartbreaking. And he mentioned there wasn't even enough left of his son to bury. Um, I also read the impact statement written by Nathan O'Brien's mother, Jennifer and oh my gosh the words you have to read it you can find it online they're so powerful and I can't even imagine for a second the pain and the grief and the suffering still to this day they're feeling I'm sure but if you read it you can kind of have a tiny half a percentage of the pain they must go through and feel so yeah it was oh, sad so after weeks of testimony and 10 hours of deliberations, Doug Garland was convicted of three counts of first degree murder. Obviously, while this conviction means that Doug Garland will live the rest of his sorry, pathetic life behind bars and he won't be able to hurt any other families, Nathan's parents know that this will not bring their three loved ones back. Through their grief, they cope day to day by raising their two boys. They also created the Nathan O'Brien Children's Foundation, which is which was actually helped fund by a anonymous donation of $1 million, which I think is amazing. And due to Nathan's love of sports, each year they have a decathlon where children come out and learn to play hockey, which was something that Jennifer and Rod say Nathan would have loved to do. He loved hockey, he loved all sports. The O'Brien family knows that Nathan's spirit, along with his grandparents, live on in heaven as beautiful angels, which I think is lovely. And that's this very, very, very devastating, heartbreaking case. I always am amazed by the families who have lost their loved ones in such horrific circumstances and turn it into an amazing cause, doing good for others so that their loved ones do not die in vain. They're keeping their memory alive and doing good things in their names. And I really, really commend Rod and Jennifer for doing that while still raising their two boys. And I just think that's wonderful. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you wanna see more solved or unsolved cases, let me know. Stay safe, everyone. Enjoy every day. Tell the people that you love that you love them. And I will see you in my next video.